Today's date is 5-15-2019. We're here at Lyle Station for a talk on the history of Lyle Station. Uh, the station we just passed, it's a uh, uh, train station and we'll try to view that at the end of this tape. This is the school and uh, it's uh, a very historical place and we're talking about the Underground Railroad here. Uh, Princeton High School, kind of north of it, about a block, block, about two and a half blocks, I guess. And Lincoln School was uh, organized uh, back when we built this one here in 1922, and the school up there was 1904, so when the high school was built. And there was a book of it upstairs. I know. What do you know? know? I'm a historian. I'm a you? Historian. I didn't say that. I'm listening. <laughs> I'm learning. But in 19, uh, 1904 is when they built up high school and they had very little uh, sports events until the African Americans in the community here pulled together and got an attorney to push forward to have sports within the Lincoln School. And that's when they came up with uh, basketball and football. And that would have been probably in the early 20s when that Developed. And these kids that went to school here in Lincoln had to go to the African American schools in the far towns, like they played Vincennes, there was a, a school up there in Vincennes, all black school, and then they traveled over to Carbondale, down into the, the southern part of Illinois, and they played Evansville School. So they had probably six or seven schools that they actually had a chance to go and play basketball and football at that time. Yeah. Let me be a little bit, show my being a newcomer to Southwest Indiana. Mm -hmm. When did African Americans get the right to vote in Indiana? Because they were effectively disenfranchised. Well, uh, I don't, you mean like for the presidential election and some of that? Well, first local and then. Um, well, local, if you own 50 acres, you can vote for like, like in the uh, uh, road superintendent and commissioners and stuff like that. You had to have a pretty good large farm before yeah. you were recognized as being a landowner to be able to vote. But I don't know the date on that. Honestly, I don't. But uh, I know Joshua Lyles was the first African American in Gibson County to serve on a jury duty. I do know that. I did research. What year was that? Hmm? What year was that? I knew you something. It's going to be late because it couldn't, was, they couldn't, they couldn't um, testify in a court case in which a white person was a party from the first state constitution. So it was so in post the 30s? 1930s? The, yeah, 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 that yeah, somewhere in the that 30s. sounds right. Yeah, that was town that. was incorporated in like 36 or 38. But 18. 18. 18. But they couldn't. But he didn't serve for another hundred years because blacks weren't allowed by state law to testify against a white person in a uh, court right. So he would have been real old. Oh yeah. yeah. He would have been in his 50s probably when he first got a chance to go and sit on a court case. And he was, you know, there was probably, uh, there's probably four uh, family names that were looked up on in the county as a, uh, a good leader of uh, citizenship, you might say, and that was Joshua and the Roundtree because he was a postman, and his dad was very, uh, James Roundtree came in here at an early age, and he was well known uh, for his uh, expertise. And in fact, James Roundtree uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court to get a case on building a bridge over here. And in 1872, that was just unheard of of African Americans challenging the laws of Indiana to prove themselves to make something like a bridge being built across the river. That was just unheard of. And so it made front page news on several of the newspapers. I'm still in your shell. You're Let's good. go. Let's go are with we, you. Are we ready to start on what time is it? Uh, I got about it's seven or eight after. All right, it's time. Other people come in. Thank you so much. They'll come in right in, won't they? That's exactly. Have a seat. 
Well, thank you for spending a, a lovely evening with me tonight. If, I don't know if I'd have been here if I wasn't talking because it's so pretty out. Uh, my name is Jeannie Regan Dinius. I'm a state employee, so I hope when you leave, you feel like your tax dollars are doing something worthwhile. And they gave me 45 minutes to talk about 300 years of history. So, first off, I'm going to talk fast, but no, uh, what, what's going to happen is I'm going to cover briefly uh, the types of people, the types of things that would happen with the Underground Railroad. What I hope I give you is a critical eye to it. This uh, history is heavily seeped in myth, and I'll talk about why and how we got that way. And so people make up a lot of stories because everybody wants to be on the good side of history, and we think of the people who worked on the Underground Railroad as heroes today, and so everybody wants to be a part of that. And so we're going to talk about how that got to that place. No one wants to talk about the bad people. We wouldn't have needed the good people if we didn't have the bad people. So you have to think about that as we um, kind of move forward. Uh, I do work for the Department of Natural Resources, and a lot of people are like, DNR has historians. There's a whole division under um, the Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology. We come out of a federal act that was created in 1966 that got the federal government involved in the preservation of the built environment. And they required each state to have a state preservation office. In Indiana, they put us in DNR. Why DNR? It's your state preservation, or it's your state legislature. There's, you know, there's a couple of different reasons, but we um, do, we put buildings on the National Register of Historic Places, we give grants to not-for-profits to do preservation, we monitor all archaeology that happens in the state, but the big thing that we'll need to remember is we have responsibilities to the National Park Service. I will tie this all in at the end and it will all make sense. So before we can talk about um, why someone would run, I need to talk a little bit about slavery. I don't know if you've ever seen this drawing, but this is the ideal way to ship your cargo, people, from the western part of Africa. The vast majority of people came from the western part of the continent. Um, they were kidnapped. There were some people who were um, went into slavery in other ways, but the vast majority were kidnapped, put on ships like this. They are lined out on platforms. So it's a platform of people, another platform of people as you go. Because slave traders didn't make any money if these individuals died. They made money when they sold them when they got here. So this was supposed to be the best way to ship them over here. Um, I will tell you, so many people died on these ships that sharks used to follow the slave ships. So that because when someone died, they would throw them off the back. So um, it tells you how many people are dying. They would come to the New World. Every part of the New World allowed for slavery. So from Canada to Argentina and everywhere in between allowed for slavery. So do not think of this as a southern United States thing. We could actually do a talk on world slavery, but I get, again, I only have 45 minutes, so we're not going to do that. But so don't think of it as just a southern United States thing. Every part of New World allowed for it. Every um, colony allowed for it. So Georgia and Massachusetts and New York all allowed for slavery. When we became a country, every state allowed for slavery, but some slowly uh, made it illegal to have them there. So not just a southern United States thing. Actually, the most profitable slave trader in the United States where do you think he was from, lived, and worked? New York City. You're paying attention? Thank you. It did not buy, but you're close. <laughs> Rhode Island. So a Rhode Islander was the most profitable person doing this to other human beings, to get them over to the New World, to sell them to, um, into slavery. Now when an individual got here, their lives that were enslaved were not, um, they had no choices. So you couldn't decide where you were going to live, who you were going to live with, what job you were going to do, who you were going to marry, who you were going to have children with, and you were never paid for your labor. And so remember that as I'm talking about different things happening to fugitives as they run, that they're never paid for your la their labor, so you kind of question sometimes how did they get that accomplished, how did they would do that. And if they were punished, um, they were punished brutally, um, and um, usually publicly. And the public was to prevent other slaves from doing whatever it was that was bad, like running away. As historians, we need to think of these individuals like being bought and sold like cattle. Because if we think of it in that way, we can get into the right documents. And so my examples are, very few people today can afford just to purchase a house. So what do you do? You get a mortgage. Very few people can afford just to purchase someone at this time, and so there are bank mortgages on individuals. You mortgage, or you insure your property, they insure their property. And so we're starting to look at insurance documents and insurance papers to see about how many people are claiming runaways as, as a, a, an insurance claim, and things like that. And so periodically new documents will pop up and it'll change our views of things or it'll blow up in a whole new case because we find individuals being listed as having fugitives who ran and things like that because of these new documents. Um, so for historians, it's difficult and you need to, you know, we want to humanize them, but we have to think in terms of the documents of the time period is what's the most important. All right, then you're going to talk about Indiana. 
If I would ask most Hoosiers at this time, is slavery wrong, they would have said yes, and then never done another thing about it. Wouldn't have thought about it, wouldn't have even mentioned it probably in passing. Then you have a few people who are willing to go to meetings. This is an anti-slavery meeting um, for LaPorte County, which is way up on the Michigan border, in 1842. Very early on, we had um, anti-slavery groups around the state. You would go to a meeting and listen to someone talk about the evils of slavery. You'd write letters to the editor and try to get the um, editor to publish them in the paper so you could convince somebody else that slavery was wrong. A minister would preach on the pulpit. You'd work on a, a political campaign that was trying to end slavery. The two big ones were the Free Soil Party and the Liberty Party. And so you were doing things that were uh, needed to be done to legally end slavery in the United States. We call these people abolitionists. And, but just because you're an abolitionist doesn't mean you're willing to kind of step over that line and break the law to do underground railroad work. The words slave and slavery are not in our U.S. Constitution, but there are 10 provisions dealing with it. And the first law that allowed for the recapture of a fugitive slave was signed in 1793 by George Washington. So uh, a fugitive coming from Kentucky into Indiana could be chased, arrested, and taken back. And so um, the people who were helping these individuals find freedom by hiding them, to finding places for them to, to get food and clothing and stuff like that, cannot be confused with the people doing this. Because these people, the abolitionists, thought the Underground Railroad people were crazy. They were radical, they were too far, they were causing problems. It's because of them we couldn't get the laws passed to stop slavery. And so you can't cross it because they would not have crossed it. And so it's a very important thing to remember. The other important thing to realize is that, so the Indiana State Anti-Slavery Society, so the state group that was about abolition, only had about 200 people in it as members. And that's it. So not as many Hoosiers were even working towards the legal end of slavery, so you have to cut the number of doing underground railroad work even further down. And then the other group that you need to deal with are the colonizations. And they're an odd little group, so odd that I just, I'm writing my master's thesis on them. I should defend at the end of June. So, may or may not have been anti-slavery. They kind of ran the gamut of some were opposed to slavery, some weren't. But they did not want blacks to be next door to them. And so the solution was, it was a national organization. They bought land in Africa, made a country called Liberia, still exists today. And then they raised money and recruited individuals to go to Africa. Not popular within the African American community. Um, some of these individuals had not been to Africa in four, or five, six, seven generations. Mm. Most of them weren't from Liberia or the Liberia area, so why would they want to go back there? Um, and they didn't know what it was to be African or Liberian, they were Americans because they had been here for so long. Um, I'll tell you what, Gibson County, you guys were really involved in this. You had several um, local chapters of colonization society, so maybe next year, once I defend my thesis and everyone doesn't say I'm an idiot about this, I can come back and talk about the different types of groups that were participating, who was participating in doing this. But um, this whole neck of the woods had a very interesting affair with the colonizationists. Put this on your account. All right, definitely. It's an interesting story. Um, so then you have, you decide to run. You are going to be chased, and you're going to be chased because you're valuable property. Um, you're going to be chased for two reasons. One is that you're worth a lot, and two, if they don't bring you back, it's going to encourage everyone else to run. So more slaves were ever returned than ever found freedom, So because you're being chased by bounty hunters. They're usually young men in the communities who um, take contracts. So I'm a slave owner, my slave runs, I give you the contract, you go and chase this person down and bring him back. You'll make more money if he leaves the county than if he's in the county, and you'll make more money than most farmers make in an entire year. So a very, very profitable thing. It's legal, and it's kind of exciting. Then you get the Hoosiers in Indiana who are reading in the newspapers, and I can find them from Evansville all the way up to Fort Wayne and South Bend, reward ads. So not only do I give a bounty hunter a contract, I put reward ads in the paper saying, my slave Sam ran away, he's wearing a blue shirt and red pants, and I'll give you $1,500 for his return. It's about $40,000 in today's terms. And all you gotta do is turn someone in who you don't know, who's breaking the law, and who you probably have attitudes about. So a slave coming into Indiana did not know who was gonna help them, and who was gonna turn them in for the reward ad. Enter always helps. But you can come to Indiana, we're a free state, right? All of my questions are trick questions. Say the exact opposite of what you think. All right. 
So slavery on a Northwest Ordinance, which made the Indiana Territory, said no slavery northwest of the Ohio River. But I'll tell you what, and you guys probably know where Vincennes is because you're from this area. Over here in Vincennes, which was the Indiana Territorial Capital, we can find lots of people who were enslaved there in different documents. We become a state in 1816. Our state constitution says no slavery in the state. But I'll tell you what, back over here in Vincennes, it's in 1820. So we become a state in 1816. In 1820, Polly sues for her freedom. She found a local lawyer who would take her case. And her case went all the way up to the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court was in court at that time, so down here. And so they ruled, yeah, you're still being held as a slave. That's illegal. You are free. And we can prove five years later she's still being held as a slave. Because the guys in, in, Terra, or in Vincennes did not care about what the guys in um, court had to say. So we had slavery. Albeit illegally, we had slavery in Indiana. Um, second way we had slavery in Indiana is I could live along the river. I could live um, in Jeffersonville go over to Louisville and say, look, I need some guys who work my farm, and you send five of your slaves over, and they work my farm, and I pay you. That's slavery. And then the other way is through an indentured servant. Now, most of us think of an indentured servant as someone from England or Ireland who wants to come over to the New World but can't afford it, and so they do a contract, and someone pays for them basically to come over. Indiana, it's a little different. In 1805, we um, passed a bill that was called the Introduction of Negroes and Mulattoes to the State. And basically what we did is you could go to the South, purchase someone, bring them back to Indiana, and make them an indentured servant. The contract holder determined how long that um, contract was for, and the contract followed the children. That's slavery. We just don't call it that. So, we did have slavery in the state. We had free blacks in the state. Miles Station is a good example of that. We had not all African Americans who lived here were enslaved, and we had lots of free black settlements in the area. Um, couldn't vote early on, couldn't serve in the militia, couldn't send their kids to school, but that important law that we talked about could not testify in a court case where a white person was a party. And so what that means is I come over and accuse you of being my slave, who wins every time? Me, because you can't testify on your own behalf. And so we have a lot of what we call man-stealing, kidnappings basically, and there are a lot of letters between the governor of Kentucky and the governor of Indiana to get them to stop man-stealing our Hoosiers. Um, so we have that. And then we have a fugitive slaves. Um, my first fugitive slave uh, um, I have in the state is over here in Wayne County. 1821, Peter Lewis's plantation. How did, what did he do between 1821 and 1824? I have no idea. But 1824, he shows up in Wayne County, and he's he bought some land, and he's just farming. He's just living his life. These bounty hunters, who they're my next group of people after I get this colonization that's done, I'm gonna study the bounty hunters. They show up places, they know things, and I have no idea how. So they show up in Richmond, which again at that time is about that big, in a state that's about that big. Of all the places they could go, they go to Richmond and wait outside the store where Peter shops. There are 669 other African Americans in Richmond and Wayne County at that same, same time period. They could have kidnapped anyone. So Peter's the one they're after. So they wait for him, they catch him. And according to state law, you can be extradited, but, you're, but there's a very specific process. So you have to go to the Justice of the Peace Office and um, wait for the owner to come and identify the slave. So they put Peter in jail, and then the bounty hunter goes back to Kentucky to get his owner. And so while we wait, and this is what the court case says, a violent mob of Quakers, which I love because we think Quakers are all pants, a violent mob of Quakers, yes. My mom is actually two guys. So two Quakers beat up the jailer and break Peter out of jail. I don't know what happened to Peter after that, we just hope he found some freedom. But then what's on the left is my two Quakers, and what do you do with them? Well, that 1793 law I told you about was a civil penalty, not a criminal penalty. So the um, owner of Peter sued. He sued him for a loss of property, and in 1825 he was given $1,500 each. So we got $3,000 for the inconvenience of loss of property. So remember in Indiana, we have free blacks, we have slaves, and we have fugitive slaves all living in the state. <clears throat> All right, you will see this map or some semblance of this map in every exhibit, book, website. I hate this map. And when I get done explaining, you too will hate this map. All right, so the map was started by a professor from Ohio State University in the 1880s. And he wrote every postmaster in the United States and said, tell me about the underground railroad activity in your community. And they would write back and say, oh, we did, I did this, talk to John. And then they'd, he'd write John, and John would say, I did this, talk to Jim, back and forth and back and forth. So who are the um, postmasters in 1880 in the United States? 
White guys. White guys, exactly. So this tells me what white guys knew about what other white guys were doing. And I know this because the Indiana letters still existence. They're in the Indiana State Library, so you can go up to Indianapolis and you can read all these letters back and forth between people. It's a great, fascinating thing, but apparently we women, when someone knocked on the door, we just disappeared. We weren't the ones really feeding them and you know, helping out also. And it doesn't talk about African Americans at all, or very little. So it's a good start of a map, but it's not a complete map. Second reason I hate this map is that it implies routes. It implies that every time you come into Madison, you're gonna to go to Columbus. And we know it's not true for a variety of reasons. We have settlement patterns, people moving in, moving out, dying, the roads. You think the roads are bad now? Imagine 1840, muddy roads, all the rain we've had, there's no bridge, and how are you gonna get across? So you can't go that way. And then, then it's those pesky bounty hunters. If I always go into your house, but we know the bounty hunters are staking out your house because bounty hunters did not make any money turning him in. Bounty hunters made money returning fugitive slaves. So they're going to stake out this house. Why would we go that way? We won't. We're going to go this way. So think of it as a web of potential paths and not one, one spot, one route. And then the third reason I hate this map is it implies everybody's working at the same time. And it's not the case. The people in Madison are working at the dates different times than the people way up in Auburn. And again, settlement patterns and all of that. So it's a good start of the map, and it's the map that we started with when we started doing our, uh, um, our research, and we have just blown this map up. So. All right, so if you are going to come to get freedom, you have to go to Canada, right? I'm going to say the exact opposite of what you think. Well, no, of course not. All right, if you're living in Georgia, does it make more sense to go to Canada or Southern Florida where the Seminole Indians are in conflict with U.S. government and allow the slaves to come in and be a part of their tribe? If you're in Texas, it makes more sense to go to Canada or Mexico. Mexico ended their slavery in 1826 and allowed American slaves to come in and live there. You could go to the western part of the country, places that hadn't been settled very much, lived there. Or my favorite place is Alaska. When I heard Alaska had an underground railroad initiative, I'm like, that's a long walk. But if you listen to their stuff and research, there are whaling ships that whale all season. And then they go into the ports of New Orleans or Boston or New York, sell their goods, and slaves would just hop on board and just sail away. Sometimes they stayed on those ships as sailors, but sometimes they went all the way up to Alaska. And there are descendants of runaway slaves in Alaska today. So don't just think Canada, but we like to think Canada and Indiana because then maybe they came through Indiana, maybe they came through the last stationary. It's kind of what we're hoping for. So but the first thing you got to do is you got to get across that river. Um, the Ohio, there are no bridges across the Ohio River until after the Civil War. So how are you going to get across it? You're going to swim. You're going to steal a rowboat. You are going to have somebody from Kentucky row you across. My favorite, his name is Freeman Anderson. He is um, living across from the Hanover College area down by Madison. And we know he worked about 13 years, almost every night, rowing people across, watching them get out and run towards freedom. And what I find fascinating about him is he himself was enslaved. And this is what we're actually finding, is the start of the Underground Railroad is with the slaves themselves. I don't have the courage to run, but you do. We're gonna make sure that they can't tell you're gone for several days. You get to the next plantation, that group of uh, slaves are gonna help you with some food directions, you know, where you're going. You know, follow the North Star is vague, helping you get in the proper direction, but not to the right house, not to freedom. So the next group of slaves is going to help you. And um, Freeman was one of those individuals who rode him across and came home every morning to go back into, into slavery. So uh, that's kind of where we're starting um, in there in the south. You're going to take one of the ferry boats. There are ferry boats every day from like Louisville over to Jeffersonville and New Albany. And there are lots and lots of complaints in the uh, New Albany and the Louisville papers that the captains are not asking slaves for their passes. A slave to be all plantation needed a pass. It said their name, their owner's name, where they're supposed to be in dates. Because slaves traveled around and came into Indiana to do business for their owners. But if they were asked by anybody, they had to show their papers. And so this would help them. Well, if the captain and their crew didn't help, they asked them for their papers, they could come over to Indiana without permission and start moving north. We don't know if the captain and his crew were um, empathetic and said, you know what, I'm just, we're going to ignore that they're here or not. Whether they were indifferent, whether they had a boat to run and they didn't care, or whether they were being bribed. But for whatever reason, there's lots of complaints about it. And then the last way across the river is to walk across it. Because the river today, I know it's crazy, but it's not the river of today. Um, in the 1850s, in the summer, it used to dry up enough that you could wade across it. 
um, sometimes even to get into some sandbars. And in the um, winter, it used to freeze solid, and you'd get an ice bridge. And we actually know three different times that it did that, that actually um, plantation owners moved their, the few, or moved their slaves farther south to get them away from the ice bridge. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get across that bridge somehow so that we can start moving north. Levi Coffin is the most notorious, most infamous Hoosier. It's not really a Hoosier. He's from North Carolina. He's one of the Quakers that comes, the Quakers in North Carolina are sick of living around slavery, so they move to um, Indiana. Levi moves to just outside of Richmond, just north of Richmond, um, builds this house. And that's all I want to tell you about him, because you can go visit this house. It is a part of the State Museum sites. Everybody talks about Levi. Everybody writes books about Levi. What yes. was his last name? Coffin. Coffin. Like a, like a dead coffin. Yeah. Um, and everybody talks, and there's tons of you Google Levi Coffin, you'll get more stuff than you want. So I'm going to talk about stuff that nobody else talks about. So you're going to come across the river over there at Madison, maybe Freeman um, rode you across. You're going to go into the Georgetown neighborhood. If you have never been to Madison, Go. It's my favorite town in Indiana, hands down my favorite place. And one of the reasons it's my favorite place is 70% of the buildings standing today are from the time period. So you are seeing the same buildings that a fugitive would see. They're going to come into the neighborhood, they're going to come into the Georgetown neighborhood. It's the free black neighborhood in, um, in uh, Madison. And that's what we're finding actually is the start of the Underground Railroad in Indiana is with the free black communities. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Most of us sitting in this room look like the people enslaving them. Why would they trust us? Because I said, honest, I'm here to help. No. They're going to come across the river. They're going to find respite. They're going to find um, some refuge, a plan. And then the people who live in Georgetown know who the white community can be trusted. And then they're going to start moving them north. Um, so it's the, the kind of the place to start. My favorite guy here, he owns the middle house there with the porch. Um, his name is Elijah Anderson. And Elijah was our Harriet Tubman. When I talk to fourth grade teachers about Harry Tubman, she's an amazing person in U.S. history and needs to be taught, but she never stepped foot in Indiana. So you can talk about what she did, which is she would go on to plantations, organize groups of people off, and then say, and we had Elijah doing the same thing. He would go down to Kentucky, spend maybe two weeks kind of moving around in different plantations, talking to people who wants to go, who wants to go, and then he take them off. Imagine being a plantation owner, you wake up in the morning and everyone's gone. <laughs> Elijah had a bounty on his head, he wanted dead or alive. How did they know it was Elijah? I don't know. But they did know he was up to stuff. Um, in 1840, we called the Kentucky Mob, a group of Kentuckians came across to break up this underground railroad cell. They knew they were doing stuff in here, they were sick of him of it, they were sick of um, government not stopping it, and so they came over to beat some people up. So they beat up a couple people, tried to drown a few people in the river, Elijah decides it's time to leave. And so he um, actually goes to Cleveland to work on the end of the Underground Railroad, getting people over into Canada. But he actually keeps coming back to Kentucky to organize those groups. Unfortunately, one time he was caught. He was arrested. He went to trial for the, the Kentucky state law was enticing a slave off the plantation. And he went to jail. He went to the Frankfurt Penitentiary. Because he went to jail, anybody's a genealogist here, in 1845, which is the year he went to jail, if you know anything about your ancestor except they were alive, you are happy. Because there's so few documents in the 1840s. Well, because he went to prison, I have his prison intake. I know how tall he was, I know how many scars he had, whether he could read and write, how much he drank, all that kind of stuff. Um, he did die in jail. If you ask anybody in Madison, they will tell you he was murdered. I was just down there in March for a tour, an underground railroad tour, and I'm like, Jamie, of course he was murdered. The documents say he was found dead in his jail cell. There were other African American Hoosiers in the jail at the same time for the same law being broken, so I don't know how he died, but he died in jail. If you talk to a Madisonian, though, they will tell you he was murdered. All right, if you come across in New Albany, the Underground Railroad's a little different. And I say it's Underground Railroad, it's not underground, and it's not a railroad. It's not, you'd be surprised how many people walk, where are the tracks? It's not a subway system. This is people helping people. Um, and actually, it's not even tunnels. We have a myth out there that it's tunnels running from house to house or house to barn. There is one documented tunnel in the entire United States, and it's in upstate New York. So most of the time, people tell me, oh, well, there's this hidden room in this house. Well, it's probably there for other reasons. There's other things that we can talk about of why houses had root cellars. This is nothing shocking. But what the Underground Railroad is, is giving somebody a place to stay, 
whether it's in your bed, in the, on the floor, in the barn, in your woods, say, I promise no one will find you back there. Some medical attention if they need it, some food, a change of clothes, whatever it is they need, and then directions, or even a ride to the next house that will give them the exact same thing. You know, this is not these hidey holes and hiding behind the walls, because that just doesn't make sense. How are you going to hide behind a wall, a false wall? That doesn't, it's not something that's usable. But uh, food, that's usable. Food will get you to the next um, spot, and a ride, a horse, will get you faster than running. Um, so that's what it really was. The other thing people started using early on was the railroad itself. And the first railroad in Indiana is going from the river up to the Indianapolis to the, to the capital, getting goods and stuff up there. And so think about how your life would be different if you ran from Indianapolis, from or Albany to Indianapolis, or if you got to take the train. It changes the face of the slave. And when I say that, what I mean is 1820s, it's young men 18 to 25. My personal opinion why is they have the stamina, they have the attitude, and they didn't have their children that they had to bring with them. By the time of the Civil War, we find 10 and 11 year old girls, two girls were arrested in Indianapolis coming off the train um, for hiding in it. We find women, um, as one woman in Decatur County, she um, had her five kids with her, 12 and four. I can't get to the airport with myself, I can't imagine. And you're not only are you running, but you're running with people chasing you. Um, and so it really changes, the help that people are giving is what changes what type of person is running on the underground railroad. All right, now if you come across over in this neck of the woods, specifically, not specifically Evansville, but next door to Warwick County, you might run into Ira. Now, Ira's a conductor. Now, I said that it's not the Underground Railroad, but we use railroading terms. The conductor helps packages move from station to station. These are not terms that historians have made up. These are actually terms that they are using. We find letters between each other saying, next week I'm going to send two packages packages to you, I'm going to let you know they're on the way, things like that. So these are terms they're using. So I was a conductor, which means he either helps with directions or a ride, things like that. The other thing he used to do is he used to walk up and down the Ohio River looking for bounty hunters. Because bounty hunters were walking up and down the Ohio River looking for people crossing. And if Ira found a bounty hunter, he'd beat them up. <laughs> all different too. Now, I'm moving you all around the state because I don't have time to talk to, about everybody, and I don't want you thinking straight around. So don't assume these people knew each other or were working together. I'm just kind of showing you samples and examples. All right, so just north of Madison is Lancaster. Now, normally in a county, if I'm talking about over the entire run of the Underground Railroad, if I have more than 10 people, I think that's a lot. Because um, there's not a lot of people participating and willing to do the kinds of things. This community was very different. They were from the Carolinas, they were Baptists, they were living down there, sick of living around slavery. So they moved up to the Lancaster area to start an underground railroad enclave. Um, when I was down there in, uh, down in Madison in um, March, I think there were 25 families, and this is multiple people per family. So this is an oddity, there's not usually this many people. The other thing that they did is they built this Eleutherian College. I think it should be called Eagle Theory to Elementary School. So don't think of it as, um, you know, University of Evansville or USI or something like that. Mm -hmm. The amazing thing about it is it was built to, in, in, in the same classrooms. They educated men, women, whites, and blacks at the same time. This is unheard of anywhere else in the world in 1848 except one other place. Does anybody know where? Korea. Where? Korea? No. Korea. Korea. No, oh, Korea College? No. We were, far more advanced than they were. <laughs> the Union Literary Institute in Randolph County, Indiana. Uh -huh. So in Indiana in 1848, we were on the cutting edge of education. And the difference is, is that all the genders together, and all the races together, a lot of schools wouldn't do that. Um, so that was kind of crazy that way. Now, the um, Hoyts were a family that associated with the, the college. And I talked about them for family dynamics. Um, the daughter, when she was in her 90s, started writing historians in Indiana saying, you're not talking about my father, let me tell you what he did. So when she was a child, she shared a room with her parents, and one night he left, um, left the house, and so she followed him. She went out to the barn, there were five black men in the barn. She scurried out, he grabbed her, he caught her, he sat her down, and explained to her that she, what he was doing, and that she couldn't tell anybody. It was illegal, it was violent. The gentleman who published the anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator. So all he did was write in newspaper columns and stuff like that that slavery was wrong. 
His, um, his uh, shop was firebombed twice, and he was murdered for just saying our, uh, uh, slavery was wrong. So imagine if they caught somebody. And so he, they knew um, that it was, it was something that was wrong and should, or it was something that they couldn't tell their children. Think about your children and the things that they have told people in the grocery store about life at home. That's why they didn't tell their kids, because pe until your kid was, could keep their mouth shut, and not tell anybody what you're doing, you wouldn't have shared this with them. Had she not experienced this with her father um, at a young age, she may never have known about it. He died in 1857, so he died before the war, and we may never have known about what he was up to because he wouldn't have told her about it. We have other people who didn't talk about it after the war. That professor I told you that was writing all those people, he um, wrote this one gentleman and said, tell me what you did, and I heard you were working on the Underground Railroad. And the guy wrote back, I did what I did because it was the right thing to do. Please don't bother me again. As a human being, I respect that. As a historian, it hurts my heart. Because it's like, okay, what were you, what were you doing? What, what did you do? But people just may not have talked about it afterwards. And then we have um, up here in Marion, where people talked about it a bunch, just outside of Marion. It's called the Weaver Settlement. It's a free black settlement up there. They have a very long tradition of um, Underground Railroad oral tradition. But we can't find any documents to support their, their stories. Oral traditions are tough. And my family is the perfect example of why sometimes you can't believe grandma. So <laughs> since I have been this big, I have been the kid when I go to my grandparents' house, I would sit around the table and they would tell me stories about growing up and you know family stories. And my grandfather <coughs> told me lots of stories about the family and our family history. And I have very vivid stories of horse riders being grown behind the outhouse because we were part of the Heinz Ketchup people. So we were supposed to be a part of this legend. So I go to college at Paul State, I get my history degree, I start doing my own genealogy, and I can prove we didn't come over until 1901 and we were nowhere near Pittsburgh. <laughs> I never lied to me. Um, and so um, I asked my mom, because my grandfather died when I was in seventh grade, so I can't you know, ask him, Grandpa, why'd you lie to me? Um, but I asked my mom, why didn't you guys ever stop and say, you know, Dad, that's not right, you know, that's not true. And she's like, it wasn't hurting anything. <laughs> Again, as a historian, it hurts my heart, but people make up stories, they exaggerate, they forget the truth and they add something on, or they heard somebody talking about it, and they just add it into the story. So, oral traditions are tough. And so, the, if you talk to the weavers, they got a ton of stories they can tell you about things that happened. I can't talk about them because we have to document every story. I hope one day we find these documents that will help tell their story, but like I said, crap a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, if you go all the way up to Orland, Indiana, um, it's where some Hoosiers are arrested under a new law. So that 1793 um, law that I told you George Washington signed, it was a civil case, not a, there was no teeth to it, it wasn't enforced very well, and there are other things going on in the country about expansion of slavery into other states. We get the Compromise of 1850, and we get the new Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. It's a criminal case now. So my first two years arrested are arrested up there for helping Tom, Tim, and Alfred. How did Tom, Tim, and Alfred get from their Kentucky plantation all the way up there? I have no idea. That's where they're caught, though. They are sent back home, and I get five Hoosiers who are put on trial for this. Four of them were found not guilty for a variety of reasons. There were some technicality issues and stuff like that. But the last one, Benjamin Waterhouse, was found guilty of a violent new law three times for helping Tom, Tim, and Alfred. Um, the judge could have given him 10 years in, or 30 years in jail and a $10,000 fine. The judge gave him 30 minutes in jail and a $30 fine. Uh -huh. So we're looking at the judge, yes. Um, this stint in jail did not affect Waterhouse. He used to advertise in the newspaper that anybody who came to his house would find freedom. And he used to burn an effigy bounty hunters at rallies and things like that. So he's kind of a, he was kind of a troublemaker. I think I would have liked him. <laughs> now this house is one of the houses of one of the gentlemen who was found not guilty. Isn't that a beautiful farmhouse? And this is unfortunately what it looks like today. It's a, it's a mucked up mess, and mucked up is our technical term for, you know, eight apartments and just kind of... Um, so people will call me all the time and say, this house was on the Underground Railroad. And I'll say, that's nice. Who lived there? Because it was the people who lived there who did the work. The house didn't do anything. And a lot of times the house, actually almost all the time, the house doesn't tell me anything. There's nothing about that house that says Underground Railroad activity. But we can prove a lot of things that he did. And so while I work for the State Preservation Office, we are about the preservation of the built environment. I am the one person in the office. I'm a gossip of people, of dead people. I want to know their stories. I want to know what they were up to, because that's going to tell me whether they were participating or not. 
Um, and so unfortunately, a lot of our underground armored houses look like this, or they're just torn down in general. Now, people tell me all the time, you can't talk about this history, you can't prove it because it's a secret. Well, it wasn't as secret as we think it is. Are you guys all looky-loos? Your neighbor does something and you're looking out the window going, what are they up to again? Oh. They were looky-loos also. I was in Huntington reading the paper for, um, for the project and I found a letter to the editor in 1855. Reverend Chamberlain is running Negroes through his home and someone should do something about it. So clearly the neighbors saw Reverend Hamlin doing things, and instead of turning him in, he passive-aggressively wrote a letter to the editor. Um, Reverend Chamberlain was a Baptist minister, he was not in Huntington very long, he pretty much left after that letter, <laughs> he wonder <went for> why. <laughs> um, but again, neighbors knew what neighbors were doing. Some of the court cases are hysterical if you start looking at the distances between farms. This one gentleman said, I noticed that he was bringing more wood into the house. And now, so I knew that that was wrong, so I decided to turn him in. Their farms were two miles apart. How much are you staring at someone's farm to notice extra wood? Um, so you get a lot of these kind of cases where neighbors are telling on neighbors. So it's not as secretive as you think. But this, the documents aren't there as easy to find as others. But sometimes it's because you have to leave the county. So the Huntington County newspaper editor was pro-South, which meant he felt it was the South right to own slaves, it was none of our business, and those pesky abolitionists and stuff just didn't mind their own business. So nothing in the Huntington paper was ever positive about <coughs> anti-slavery or anything like that. The Wabash County editor was anti-slavery, and so he would write things. So there was a rally um, in Huntington County, 200 people showed up, which is a lot of people for that time. It was an anti-slavery rally, and it's not covered in the Huntington paper at all, but it is in the Wabash paper. So again, sometimes you gotta leave the county, sometimes you gotta leave the state. Um, this is George de Baptiste. He lived in Madison for a long time. He, um, uh, the net 1840 mob came in, he decided it was time to leave. He went to, to Detroit. After the war, he was a prominent businessman, and he was at, um, interviewed all the time. He was in the Detroit Free Press, all the time talking about Underground Railroad activity in Madison, Indiana. So again, we gotta leave the state, and then sometimes we need to leave the country. I was at a conference up in Detroit, and this gentleman came up to me and said, I'm a descendant of runaway slaves, we still live in Canada, and we came through Indiana. I'm like, yeah, okay, tell me more. And I said, well, you know, what, where? He said, Attica. I said, Indiana. Attica's outside of Lafayette. At this time, it was about that day, and we had never heard of Attica doing anything but underground railroad activity. And I said, well, who? Why? What happened? He's like, oh, I don't know. We were just always told the people in Attica were good people. Mm -hmm. Think about a fugitive run. You average 15 miles a day. So how many people did you encounter along the way, both good and bad? What happened in Attica that they were good people? I, I don't know. I saw him a couple of years ago at a conference. I said, any stories? He's like, no, no one, no one has any stories of why. We just all know Attica's the good place to go. So sometimes we need to leave the, the country. I would like to go to Canada and do research up there. I've been through four governors now, five to four, four or five governors, and I'm you know, wild station, so it tells you how close I'm gonna get to Canada. <laughs> yeah. All right, blue area. Does anyone know what the blue area is? The region. Well, it's a region, but what was it before the region? Swampland. Yes, the Grand Kankakee Marshes. This is, there's no roads in here until the 1850s, 1852 to be exact. Um, so there's not a lot of settlement, and so we don't have a lot of activity in here. We do have a lot of issues, or a lot of times where we talk, the fugitives talk about using the grass to hide, uh, because they may not, they may have gone days without help, so if they're running through this area, there's no one to help them, and they use the grass. Now, I think about my neighbor's grass, who gets, you know, unruly. If you go up along 65 today, they started letting some of the, the marshland come back, and the grass, they're talking about the tall grass that like the ornamental grass, and when you get the entire seven, eight counties of grass out, it's a good hiding spot. Um, but where people were working in this area was just south of Chicago, there was a farming community. They were running fugitives across the dunes, across Lake Michigan, and where they were going was actually to Cass County, Michigan, just north of South Bend. It's a community called Cassopolis. It was a free black settlement, but it was also a fugitive slave destination. Well, eventually the bounty hunters realized Wait a minute, they're just in Michigan. They can't extradite out of Canada. Canada would not allow them to, to extradite them back to the United States. 
But Michigan's a state, so all we gotta do is go over to arrest them. So as they start arresting them out of Cassopolis and they come south, they're coming back through Indiana. And we're actually finding a lot of information through what we call the uh, reverse underground railroad. So let me tell you my two favorite stories. The first one comes out of Elkhart County, which is the county just east of the South Bend area. And again, looky-loos. What happens when um, the people come through chained together? You all go outside to see what's going on. And so a lot of people from in the small town went outside to see what's going on. The county um, uh, sheriff arrested the bounty hunter for inciting a riot. And he told, he told the, uh, the bounty hunter, I will take um, possession of the uh, custody of the um, fugitives. When you prove you've done nothing wrong, you can come back and have them back. This guy's court case goes all the way to the state Supreme Court, who ruled he didn't do anything wrong. And he didn't. You read the documents. People were just outside looking, but there was no violence. So the body hunter went back up to Elkhart County and asked the sheriff, can I please have my fugitives back? And the sheriff's like, sorry, I don't know what happened to them. They're gone. So, <laughs> so after that, we don't get anybody, or very many people coming through Elkhart County. They're coming through South Bend. And the big event that happened in South Bend, the, uh, the arrest in um, Cassopolis was for the Powell family. It's a husband and wife and their three boys. It was quite a violent exchange. There was gunfire. Um, they caught the wife and two of the boys and started south. A posse ensued. Part of the posse got in front of them, got down to South Bend, got people riled up. They got some lawyers out because they were going to file some writs of habeas corpus and other fancy legal terms like that. And the Powell's were whisked away in South Bend. And so what is the owner to do? We're under the old law of the suing. The guy sues pretty much the entire town of South Bend and won. And started, these people started having to pay fines. And um, some people couldn't afford the fines. And so the judge gave the, um, the uh, owner property. And then he started selling the property back to people at pennies on the dollar. So very interesting case that's going on out there. So, uh, yeah, so we get a lot of stuff happening up in South Bend. One of them is, maybe, yes, is uh, James Washington. James is a barber by profession. He's a conductor moving people from station to station. And the last thing I have in there is that he's a solicitor. I don't know if you noticed a couple of times I talked about um, a fugitive um, bribing somebody. How are they going to bribe anybody? They've never been paid for their labor. If we just drop them off in Cassopolis or Canada and just say, have a nice day, but they have no money, so how do they buy food, land, anything? They've never been paid for their labor. So there's a whole movement of people soliciting money, raising funds to help the fugitives. James was one of them, and he worked heavily with the Bartlett's. This is their home that still stands. This is Mrs. Bartlett. We don't believe that she had anybody ever come through her home, but she did enough fundraising for the fugitives that her friends got sick of it, and they started writing about her in their diaries. <laughs> Every time they would come to book club, she'd ask me for money. We found a receipt for 200 pairs of work boots in her, um, in her papers. That woman never wore a pair of work boots in her life. <laughs> so, I mean, again, you think about it. If you ran from Kentucky, I don't care how many days you ran, if you did most of it on the train and on the, in a wagon, you're going to need a new pair of shoes when you get to, to Canada. You're going to need um, some help getting some um, land so you can start farming and seeds. And we're going to start schools, we're going to start churches. Two printing presses were started up there for the African American community. Um, all out of people like the, um, Washington and Mrs. Bartlett um, raising funds. Now there's a lot of things we can talk about, events that lived in the Civil War, but I'm going to talk about the Civil War, I'm going to talk about three. 1857 is Dred Scott. Dred is a slave living in a part of the United States that is not supposed to have slavery. And so he finds a lawyer who takes his case. This goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. And they ruled not only was he still a slave, but that blacks were not citizens of this country. They did not say slaves, they said blacks. I'm going to deal with that later. The problem, the, 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 uh, the, um, the case was not a very popular decision, and one of them was John Brown. Now, John Brown believed, he lived in what we call bleeding Kansas, and we call it that because they were skirmishing almost daily to decide whether they were going to come in as a state, as a slave state or a free state. And John thought that the only way to end slavery in the United States was violently. It's how it ended in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, places like that. So what he was going to do, he was going to go to Harper's Ferry. It is a federal arsenal in Virginia. He's going to steal all the guns and give them to the slaves of Virginia and let them do what they're going to do. He came to Indiana to recruit. We know of two meetings that he had. One was at that Georgetown neighborhood down in Madison, and one was in Indianapolis. We don't know who was tended them. 
Um, we don't know if anybody gave him any money to help him get out to Harper's Ferry, but we do know no Hoosier went with him. We do have a Hoosier connection, though. Our governor, Governor Lane, his nephew, who was from Ohio, went with John Brown. So we have, a, we have a connection that way. And whenever you read anything, it'll say John Brown and his boys went to Harper's Ferry. Well, John Brown and his boys did, but so did other people. They had a, 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 an entourage, a group of people who were going to go and help with this. Several of them were fugitive slaves who came back from Canada, both men and women, to help on this um, raid. They were caught and they were all executed. Even the governor's um, nephew was executed. And then we get Lincoln. When Lincoln first started campaigning, he said he was not going to do anything with slavery. It was not his intent um, as running for president. And so, but he was, nobody believed him because he's a politician. So he's elected. And in, in November of 1860, December, um, South Carolina fires on Fort Sumner and secedes from the Union. Um, by 61, they have the Confederate States of America um, for the South. <coughs> so Congress abolishes slavery in D.C. And Lincoln offers the, the South a plan. This first plan is just come back into the Union. We won't try anybody for treason. We will slowly emancipate all your slaves by 1900, but the federal government will compensate you for loss of property. The South didn't want anything to do with that plan, and so the war continued. So in September 62, it went into effect in January 63, we get the Emancipation Proclamation, which did not free all the slaves. That's what we're taught in school, but what it said is, States or parts of states where their slaves are, where their their slaves are free. So if you have a state or part of state that's in a rebellion against the United States, their slaves are free. So think about that for a second. Lincoln wrote, signed a piece of paper that said, "Hey South, you don't think you're part of the, the Union anymore, and you don't think I'm your president anymore. Your slaves are free." That does not work until our troops are um, in charge. The last group of, of slaves freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, June 19, 1865, at Galveston, Texas. Now, if you know the Civil War history or not very well, the war was over in April. It just took till June to get down to Galveston and say, hey, you lost. Oh, and by the way, your um, slaves are all free. So if you ever hear the celebration Juneteenth, that's what that is. That's a celebration of the last slaves freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. But we don't need the Underground Railroad anymore, right? Well, of course we do. States in rebellion against the United States. There are five slaveholding states or territories that were um, part of the North, not part of the South. Does anyone know the closest one to Indiana? Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah. So if you think about that, and this is one of the things we were sitting, we heard from historians were sitting around a table one day and we're like, wait a minute. If there are still people enslaved, there are still more people trying to find their freedom. And so we need to start looking. Most historians stopped looking about 1863. They're like, oh, yeah, we're just done. So we started looking, and we found Hannah Tolliver. Hannah's a Hoosier living in um, uh, Jeffersonville. She's arrested over in Jefferson or in Louisville trying to help three guys find freedom. She gets tried. She goes to jail. She goes to the same penitentiary that our, my um, favorite Elijah Anderson died in jail. She went to the same penitentiary. So again, we have, and she went to the jail in 1865, May of 1865. The war was over in April, and she went to jail in May. So, because the slavery was still legal in Kentucky. So, we've switched this as Don has given us more years to do more research, and we just got a lot more to do. So, then after that, we don't need the Underground Railroad anymore. And so, we passed the 13th Amendment in 1866 that um, ended slavery in the United States. The 14th Amendment made anybody born in the United States a citizen. and something we deal with today with immigration issues, but it comes from our slave um, issues. And the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. So, now we don't need to get around there anymore. In come the historians. Wood Receiver is the professor who makes this horrible map that you all now hate. And he wrote a book in 1872 called The Underground Railroad. Anybody read it? Okay. William Still um, wrote uh, The Underground Railroad. Um, well, the so secret was not 1872, it was the 1890s, sorry, was, uh, Sills is the 1872, and um, he took notes on anybody who came through his house. Um, anybody read Sills' book? But d don't feel bad, there's a method to my madness, and you're not unique, so don't feel bad. Um, Levi Coffin wrote reminiscences about his time in Indiana and the Underground Railroad activity. Anybody read his book? <laughs> and then in 1961, Larry Garrett wrote this book. At the time, it was groundbreaking. 
Today it seems silly that it's that that was that groundbreaking, but at the time it was like blew everyone's minds. He said we should stop looking at just white Quakers and look at everybody. It's like, but at the time everyone said he was crazy and he was radical. But so this is how we do research today. Anybody read Gara's book? All right. Anybody read from Tom's Cabin? <laughs> Y'all know it's fiction. <laughs> so Harry Beecher Stowe's family were prominent abolitionists. She had one brother who was a Presbyterian minister. He preached on the circle in downtown Indianapolis at the church there. One of her other brothers sent Beecher Bibles, also those guns, out to Bleeding, Kansas. And she knew everybody. She knew Frederick Douglass, she knew the coffins. She knew everybody on the, on the circuit of abolitionist news. And so what she did is she took stories from people and made them grandiose and then wrote a, um, a magazine article. The article did so well. She did the, it wrote the book. The book so did so well, it became a traveling play. I can bet you five bucks if we looked at the Evansville newspapers, it was a play in, in Evansville. And then when movies came out, it became a movie. But, it, but it's, there's smidgens of truth in there. So I told you the Ohio River froze. Well, Eliza, as she crosses the Ohio River with her baby to get away from um, the bounty hunters, it's a raging river with icebergs. Oh, the Ohio River has never been raging and never had icebergs. And so she crosses the river. And so she took a real event. Slaves used the frozen river to cross it and made it more exciting. The other thing that happened is everybody read the exact same chapters, the exact same paragraph, the exact same words and said, oh my god, look, she's talking about us. And there are articles in almost every newspaper in Indiana that said, look, on this page, that's our community, that's our Dr. So-and-so, that's, that's who that is. So much so that if Eliza had to been in every Indiana town that claimed she wrote about them, Eliza would have spent like five years in Indiana, just trying to move from town to town, experiencing the exact same event in every town. Um, so much so that she wrote, uh, Harriet wrote, Keys to Uncle Tom's Cabin, which where she goes into who she named people after, who she um, based things on, and people thought she was lying. No, 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 she's really talking about us. So, uh, but that's where you all admitted you don't read the history books, which I understand they're not great history books. Um, and so you read the exciting fiction, or you see the exciting movies. And so this is where most of our myths come from, is from these books. This is where we get the hiding holes, the tunnels, all these kinds of things, and not the true history. So it's it's a you know it's an important book in American history and how it impacted people's thoughts, but it's not true. <laughs> all right. So then after Larry Gare's book, not a lot happens until 1998. 1998, the National Park Service was mandated by Congress to create a park, a Gettysburg, for the Underground Railroad. But they realized after doing some research that so little research has been done that we don't have enough to do the park and we've got a lot of other issues. So what they created instead was this National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. It is the official list of people, places, and events related to the Underground Railroad. And um, it, they challenged then each state to do their own, um, uh, their own work. Because remember, uh, we all have the State Preservation Office and we have responsibilities for the National Park Service. So they challenged all of us, but didn't give us any money. So I am proud to say Indiana was the only state to pick it up and say, okay, we'll do this. The guy who was the director at the time thought this was an important part of our history, we needed to do this. He knew that we couldn't do it in the state, so we created a committee. The committee has grown now so much so that it has its own, it says 501c3, and that's the Indiana Freedom Trails. And so these individuals sometimes represent a house, a county, a family, whatever. Um, they do things I can't do, and I do things they can't do. So like, I can come on a, 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 a Tuesday evening and do a talk for, it's a part of work, and it, you know, it's a county's work time. Um, and so we work together, we share resources, we commiserate with each other, and all we're trying to do is find the, a true history of Hoosiers and what they were up to. So there's 300 years of history, a very quick amount of time. I have three books over here that uh, I'll leave for a while for you guys to look at. I think if you're looking for a good read, these are the three best um, about specifically about Indiana too. So I would um, read those. I've got brochures about my office. If you know of uh, any educators, we have a lot of information on our website, not just about underground railroad, but other things for them to use. And the last thing is that I'd ask for you to do, we're doing and a part of our park service um, uh, our work with them, we have to do a plan, we have to do a uh, 
preservation plan for the state every seven years, and we're in the process now of talking about that. And what we need is our constituents, you taxpayers, your opinions on what is important um, to, to you um, that we save. And the best example that I can give you is if people don't tell us that Underground Railroad is an important part of our of history and needs to be protected, then I might not be able to spend as much time and my resources doing it. I may have to work on something else because if everyone says automobile racing history is where we should be spending all our time and money, that's what we have to do because it's not about what I think, it's about what our constituents think. So we have a, a small card over there. It took me seven minutes to do the survey. It should have taken me five, but my coworker would leave me alone while I was taking it. Um, so it's a quick survey, and it's just to help you, help us understand what you as our constituents think is important. Questions now? Things I didn't talk about, or I did, or? How many are on the ship? How many are on the ship? That's a really good question. I don't know if I've ever seen numbers. I'm sure there were, People who, I'm sure there are historians who know that, but I don't think I've ever seen it. It's got to be three or four hundred easily, um, because you got to make it worth your time to get across in those three months. So that's a good question. Now I'm going to go home with that. <laughs> yeah. What percentage? Uh, were there different ways of packing? I, it sounds <laughs> terrible for me to say that. I understand what you're saying. There were several different ways, and that became that, that drawing is a historic uh, drawing, and that became the best way. Um, there were some people who just put them in cells and, and just in cages, um, but that was supposed to be the most efficient, so you get the most amount of people on the ship and the least amount of people to die. So it, it really varied. Um, sometimes they would chain them down, sometimes not. After the Amistad, if you guys have seen the movie The Amistad, which was a, a, a mutiny of um, of the individuals on the ship, um, they started chaining them down in order to do that. The other thing they started doing is putting people next to people who did not speak their language. Mm -hmm. So you have all these, you're, you're kidnapping these people from all over Africa. They have as many different languages um, as you know, the Native Americans would have here, as we had in, in Europe, something like that. So if I put you next to somebody who does, who you speak English and I speak Swedish, we're never going to be able to. Con uh, to get together and, and make a plan to overthrow people. So that's the other thing they started doing, is doing it that way. Um, they would, you know, again, I've seen some really horrible descriptions of the way they used to, um, like you said, pack them together, so. Yeah, I, and I regret saying it. No, I, I understand. It's, 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 it's one of these things that's tough, that the vocabulary is a very tough thing of how do you say that, so um, it's, yeah. it's. It's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing for me. I give this talk all the time, and there's a whole debate about whether they are fugitive slaves, are they freedom seekers, and there's a whole debate about that. Um, so um, I think, if, for me, if you are conscious that your words matter, that's what matters. And that when you say something like, ooh, that, that didn't come out the way I meant it, I think that matters more than you made a mistake. So. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I was wondering what percentage of folks survived. Roughly 50 to 55 percent. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's it. About at least half of yeah. And so, um, now I don't know if this is true or not, and I'm going to let you say uh, Dr. Oz said this, so that tells you about it. But um, Dr. Oz was talking to Oprah, this and, that, and so I heard this and I'm like, it's an interesting concept, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know if this is true or not. But the, one of the reasons that the African American community in, in the United States has problems with high blood pressure is the salt intake. And the people who survived on the ships were the ones who had the right amount of salt intake. How their bodies absorbed salt and kept salt is what kept them alive on the ship. And so that's who, who made it over here and survived. And I was like, huh, that's an interesting concept. Um, but I think that's part of it is that the people who survived were the ones who could for a variety of reasons on those ships. But about half died. Yeah. Other questions? Well, like I said, I've got information over here. Um, if you're driving home and you're like, why didn't I ask her? You can always call me or email me, and I can get you the, the questions. If you email me, I will get you an answer of how many people fit on the ship, because that's going to be good right. Um, but we can get that list size of the ship. <laughs> well, the other thing I, I guess there's a bit of an agenda for this question that I was coming up with, and that is, um, outside of the city's jurisdiction, I can only deal with city's right, jurisdiction. Right. There's, I think it's southwest of the city. You've got, Lyle, there used to be a Lyle settlement, which I guess you know that the story, whether it's true or not, it's been written down, but I don't know how true the story is, was that apparently a 
pig from a white farmer wandered into the Lila settlement. They from were hungry, Ram so they Ram came. Yeah. The Ram house. Okay. Um, and so some of these, so, so stories can be, if the buildings aren't there to preserve anymore, uh, there's some other ways that we can do preservation of the history. Um, you guys have a historic marker out front, and the historic marker is an important way. Um, getting um, and some interpretive markers, things on the website, conversations in the community, speakers and things like that, I think are some of the best ways because, you know, we can't save every building. We, you know, sometimes we wish we could, and sometimes it's good that the building goes away. But I think some of the best ways to do it is groups like this and telling people about it, getting it to the teachers and getting accurate information to the teachers because you will not know how hard it is to get people to stop believing false stories. So if I can get the fourth grade teachers not to tell them a false story, then I don't have a whole generation of people who won't believe me when I say, no, 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 that's not what happened. Um, so I think working with the teachers is a great way to, um, to deal with that and um, just continuing to tell those stories in different places and different mediums is a great way to, to help with that. Well, okay, I didn't, didn't mean to cause that kind of trouble. But <laughs> what, I trying, what I was trying to say, though, was that the Lyle settlement was essentially told to leave by a pro-Southern sheriff from Evansville. Oh, and so then, that's why you, you guys moved up here then? Yeah, we got booed out of the town. <laughs> Bad neighbors that you are, you know. Yeah, well, Evansville has just had that. Is well, I'm going to tell you, I mean, Evansville, this whole area had a strong, um, it may have uh, anti-black um, sentiment. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and, and, as, as, you know, keepers of the history, all you can do is tell the history accurately, um, let us know, remember it so that we don't repeat it, so we don't repeat those kinds of things. But telling the story is not a, um, it, it's not a reflection upon us today, it's a reflection on the people in the past, and yeah. all we can do is tell it accurately. That's our reflection. If we tell the story inaccurately on purpose, that's a reflection upon us. But what our ancestors did is not, is we cannot we can't change, can't change that. Can't change. And I personally have a good, my, my family's from Mississippi. First thing we bought when we came to this country was land, and the second thing we bought was people. I can't change that, that in 1816 some of my ancestors bought people. But what I can do is honestly tell the story when I find documents that talk about it, honestly discuss it, because I'm trying to help, I have one woman home, we're trying, to help, we're trying to figure out if we're related and somehow, um, and figure it out when my family purchased her family, and then how that kind of comes together. That's where I can step in as someone today and, and make a, a better history and stuff. So, well, I I guess I'm uh, I'm driving with something a little bit different because the only things that I know that are left are perhaps cemeteries, Lyle Cemetery, mm -hmm. Sullivan Cemetery. Uh, there is something called the Little Africa behind you outside, mm -hmm. uh, and then the United Mine Workers is one of the few relatively decent stories because that started out as an integrated uh, union. Mm -hmm. So those, I was hoping to try and do an African American trail, but that's in county territory and I'm up in Evansville. We do have one for the historically black area of uh, Baptist Town. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is how to find grants or funds and or um, Societies that would be willing to consider sponsoring um, getting the story out, whether it's historic markers or something like that. Um, I'm at a loss. Yeah, there. I mean, I don't know your community as well, so some of it might be um, having conversations with people, bringing everyone together in a room and saying, "This is what we'd like to do, and who can help with it." Um, there's some stuff at the state level that I can get you in touch with some people. With cemeteries, they are um, a tough one across the board for preservation. Okay. Um, but even to add some of the cemeteries, some interpretive markers can go a long way of saying this was the segregated cemetery and kind of talk about why it, had, it was segregated and what that meant and stuff like that and talk about it in that way. Um, I don't know if you know Pam Peters over in um, New Albany, but she's been doing some of that stuff in New Albany. So I can get you in touch with some people. Okay, sounds good. Um, I think you may already have my card about you. I, I do have my card, yeah. Okay. yeah. And I don't know you. All right, well, thank you everyone so much for coming. And uh, if you have any questions, just give me a holler. I'll be happy to go. Okay, back in 99, we want to be very creative when we put this site on the map for Indiana. And we took two years of planning and planning. And it seemed like Saturdays for three hours. 
was a long plan. But when we got through with our plans, we were able to design this building so that it would be education in every angle. So it's community service. You know, we do community work here. We have had in the past uh, 10 years, we've had after school programs. We've done all kinds of wonderful things with this building. One of the things that we do promote very well here is the Heritage Classroom. Uh, nine school teachers, I think it was four out of five of them were retirees, but uh, here in Gibson County, it was nine school teachers that spent two years of their free time building their curriculum for this classroom. This classroom was well thought out, and the educational thing that uh, rolls out of here, the kids come in the 1920s, and they will have that setting of a day in this classroom of that same time period. They go outside for the red pump to get their drink of water. They can't use the facilities inside here. I know that sounds pretty mean, but that's the way it is. They have to go to the restrooms. They have to go to the outhouses in the back of the building. We do the basic three R's. We are credited with uh, the state of Indiana as having a full day in their classroom by having this uh, full day here at Lyle Station. With our kids that we uh, have a big circle, it's about 45 mile radius of this area. So we're in the Hopkinsville, Kentucky. We're up toward the uh, the Northern Park. Uh, we pick up Knox County, and now here in the last uh, 20 years, we're getting up into Sullivan, over in the Dubois, 87 miles into Illinois. So we have a variety of kids that come here every, you might say, year. Uh, on our uh, listing, uh, the last 10 years, we have been hosting kids here, and we're just a little over 20,000 kids. So <clears throat> we're doing something right, I'll put it like that. We have what we call work and play. Kids come and they'll actually dip and make candles with their own hands, not somebody else dressed up, but actually get experience of what it took to be part of the life of the old past. So when the uh, children come, they will actually go on the wash board with, we don't use live soap, we use, use some nice mild soap. But they actually try to wash some clothes on the wash board. We talk about the bluing. We talk about the different types of cleaning clothes and how the uh, process took place. We talk about the ice box and the ice man coming and the mail man coming. All of this term of our past and the history is presented every 12 minutes to the next station, the next station, the next station. We have butter churning. We talk about, I know you probably haven't had in the last. Uh, couple of weeks, corn cob jelly. Have we had corn cob jelly lately? Well, we have the kids had a chance to taste a cracker of corn cob jelly. Then we explained to them about the corn cob, how there was no money back in this day and time, and we had to come up with a new <coughs> source of something sweet. So we took a corn cob, we boiled it, took the processing, and made it into jelly, and that's how we came up with the corn cob jelly. So the kids get a taste, they think it's awesome, it's great talk about sassafras, and I always have the 60 kids out in front of me down there, and I'll say, how many has had this afternoon, or this this week, had a chance to taste sassafras tea? When the kids all get puzzled, look, and I said, how many had root beers this week? And they all raise their hand, you know, they had root beer flow or something, and I said, the base of root beer is nothing but sassafras. So they really do a chance to learn a lot of material when they're here. We go out to the barn, we talk about the uh, basic of farming. We talk about all the different types of corn. We talk about yellow corn, white corn, sweet corn. Every kind of corn that we grow, even the brood corn that we show on demo in here. We really cover a lot of material for our children when they're here for about two and a half, three hours. And the best that I get is standing at the two double doors, kids go out the door and he said, this is the best, these are fourth and fifth graders now, this is the best field trip I've ever been on. <laughs> because why? They got their hands dirty. Yeah, when they get ready to eat lunch and we do the video downstairs, we clean those hands, but they have had an experience 
sit down on that little bench and try to milk that cow and some of the girls get very, very confused, but it's all about showing them how it works. So when I announce downstairs on the agenda starting the day out that we're going to milk the cow, there's a big buzz going on and we got to do the count again to get everybody quiet again. <laughs> but what we have here is an excellent educational program and we put a lot of thought we put a lot of time and energy into this, and we feel like in this 20 years that we're giving back to our communities something that is not able to come into classrooms. So when they uh, venture out come here on, on a uh, field trip, they get a big picture of what the generations in the past had to deal with. We talk about the kids walking two and a half miles just to come into classrooms. And then we talk about Mr. Joe Lucas, the principal that was here. Mr. Joe Lucas gave his 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students 16 spelling words per day. And I asked the kids, I said, would you like for your teacher to give you 16 spelling words? No, 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 they don't want that. So the students that were in this school here, they were very educated big time because Mr. Lucas gave 16 spelling words per day if you miss one spelling word. That's fun work. He wrote a 500 word essay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> once you got the, uh, once you got all 16 correct, we put the butter side down and then you wrote a definition for every word. Now you can see how these kids could excel and go out into the big world and they made a big, huge difference. And we'll look a little bit of that and go to the gallery. But this room here is basically what every classroom in Indiana would look like. We are blessed to play with our school this How did you know how to work it? Duh. And Gio, Prior to the 1860s of the African American farmers in the United States. So we are the representation of that time frame of the 1860s, and we are noted as a national level now here at Lyle Station. There were three sites that was put together when they were deciding on having that roll out at the African American Museum. Lyle Station was the number one to be chose because of our 200 years of being and the farming activity, and still farming, still farming. Um, in our class, you know, when we have uh, kids come here, I like to show them the display we have up here because this is all hand labor in its time. Everything in this room was all by hand. And we explain to the kids a lot of times, they'll call these fish anchors, and I have to tell them about this the uh, sap coming out of the maple tree and how many 80 gallons of sap to get one gallon of maple syrup comes out. And you talk to the kids about Abraham Lincoln being a log splitter and putting the logs and houses up. you got to have one of these wood chisels to make that happen. So we just pinpoint a few little pieces that the kids can say, oh my goodness, I read about Abraham Lincoln building logs. Now I can see some of the tools that he actually was using back in his day and time. I don't reflect too much on the farm side because they've probably heard enough about the uh, tools on the farm. But I do like to explain, like the horse collar, it's all straw in behind the leather that's pulled around there, how it stays soft so the horses do not have anyone to harm them. The loom here is a working loom. <coughs> it will be working so that we can show in demo, uh, Janelle, one of the board members, has got to finish the grading here. But we'll have that available for the kids to actually see this in the motion. That's one of our new features. This is, uh, I think we've only had this about 10 months probably. We're always getting something new here. Something new. The old clipper, we talked about the separating of the seed. <coughs> That map looks a little bit, uh, Indiana looks familiar that Jeannie had downstairs, right? Well, 
Well, we bring the kids here. We talk about the 22 colonies up and down the state of Indiana. And 17 was about the size of the, uh, the <coughs> station. Eight, anywhere from 8 to 1,000 people lived here at one time. We talk about the Underground Railroad, how we played a role in the Underground Railroad. Charles Greer was probably our earliest settler to come here. I would say he is probably one, with the research that we were working with the Smithsonian, uh, Charles Greer came here in 1814. He owned his first 40 acres by the time he was here in the first five years. By the time 1825 rolls around, he owns 268 acres of land. And with my good friend, Professor Annalisa Cox, she says that in uh, Philadelphia, there's documents that shows Charles Greer signing on his name to some of the meetings of that William Steele that we're talking about downstairs. He was in those meetings organizing the Underground Railroad. Now here we got Gibson County, local person that is going that distance to help pull together the Underground Railroad. So he was number one coming off from New Harmony, about 13 and a half miles just south of Gibson Southern School is where he is buried, his family is buried. And that was called the Antioch, Antioch Cemetery is where he's buried in. But he was noted to be that person to go out, back outside of the uh, southwest Indiana and talk about what he had accomplished here. And I think that's how he's seen the Hardmans, the Wileses, and the Nalcoxes. And all these families came here. It's because they, they had a person to talk about his prosperity at his level of 50 years of age and 200 and some and 30 families living on his farm. And he had a railroad going through his farm and he had all these opportunity of education and building more schools for the people. He was just an outstanding person. So we're talking in the early 1800s, this man is really making a great uh, movement of African Americans settling here. And so a lot of our families that came here were mulattoes. A lot of our families that came here were free African Americans. And when we landed here, we started buying, after we put the Indians on the reservation, we started buying land here at the early years, uh, $2 an acre. <laughs> now, started out with $2 an acre, and the value of this land is almost $10,000 an acre. So, being part of the farming uh, has been, in my life, the whole time. I am, uh, at the present time, I'm 69 years old, and I've been around here at Wild Station my whole entire lifetime. I've been around farming. I still have a farm. I have a farm that's south of us here about a mile. But the farming is part of who we are, and that's why we become very attached to the history here, and we want to save this old schoolhouse of help telling the story of the history of uh, Wild Station. This is 1906, that top uh, photo there uh, are the signets from the trees are all really thick here, and we had to cut them down to actually start making farmland. And over the years, we have been uh, a wetland area here, which we had flooding problems all the way through to about I think 1937 was the last time we had just a huge amount of flooding and dis disrupt. But over here on this photo here is a three mile uh, wild station. Here's where we're standing at the present time. In the very earliest year, 1887, the church down here, the Methodist Church, it is the oldest building that is still on the foundation. Right across from that would have been two log cabins. In 1863, we were paying a dollar to a dollar fifty for our children to go to school. We had a white teacher to come to Ohio Station to teach our children all about the three R's. And from that point, <clears throat> we had overrunning of children in this community that we built this building in 1922, and it lasted until 1958 with the uh, 4,000 square feet here. This was just kind of unheard of for a rural area school to be built of this scale back in 1922. But with our dollar to a dollar fifty, 
Um, we had pay a lot of money for our starting of education in 1863 because our family saw that education was going to be our way out. And that dollar that was back in its day, you could feed a family for a nickel, you could work all week like those guys you see on the wall up there, and you got paid 75 cents on Saturday night. And that was not near enough for one child. And you had eight to 12 kids per family. So they had to come up with eight and 10, $12 wow. Dollars wow. once a month just to pay for their children to go to school. That was a giving sacrifice back in the state of time. <clears throat> Joe Lucas, this is the principal right here. Uh, he actually originated from up in uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrenceville. It's a little south of, uh, of uh, Lawrenceville would be a little town called Pinkstaff. And uh, his family came in from uh, that uh, point where he was educated. He was the uh, 38 years he was the principal here. And he ran a very tight ship when it comes down to... Uh, educating their children. Loretta Freeman is the last teacher to teach here. <laughs> Loretta started out uh, with a uh, opportunity in, in education, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades. She, she was able to pass those tests, so she skipped those grades, went all right on the, in the high school, excelled on up through high school, and, and got her college degree, and in West Virginia, 15 years old, she was teaching her kids, and her own classroom at 15 years of age. Taught school all the way up until she was 67. Opened the door for the foundation of the special uh, special education back in its day and time in the early 60s. And uh, she also helped build the foundation for the GCARC program. So just a, another youngster that went to school, got an education, and excelled at that education. Step down here to the gallery and uh, we'll talk about some of our other students. Yeah. 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 In here in our gallery, we're going to talk just a few of the uh, kids that we have panels on the wall. We probably could add another 15 or 20 on there, but right now we just have these sealed. Uh, Virgil Cliff was a youngster. This is his sister, uh, Mildred, and Virgil did not like farming, but they kept the farm ongoing. That's how they received the blue sign down there, 150 years of continuing farming with the Cliff family. Virgil was a, uh, uh, went on through uh, college, got his degree, went to New York University, outstanding professor there for 26 years. Went to Kansas, took a whole year off to go to Afghanistan and educate them on how to raise beef cattle because that was one of their big things back in the day and time on their farm. They were grain farmers and beef cattle. Uh, our, uh, one of the other farmers that's right next door to me, this, I, I really am next door neighbor to the Cliff Farm over there. And uh, Mr. Glenn Morris. African American farmer is the uh, owner of that uh, 178 acres and he still raises cattle on that same farm and ranch over there. This is uh, Alonzo Fields, Mr. Alonzo Fields. When we talked about the butler, the movie that came out called The Butler, well they didn't do any justice. They should have took the movie of Alonzo Fields and made the movie from his standpoint because he was the first African American butler in the White House. By him being the first African-American butler in the White House, he was looked up on to fail, but he proved him wrong for 21 years because he had to take care of all of the staff that ran the White House. He had to take care of the First Lady. He had to take care of the President's needs. And he had to be there to be able to sell and roll the red carpet out for every single one that came through the door. Now, you think about the most crucial time for our country is through World War I and World War II, right? This man is on the job from 5.30 in the morning to 11 at night, and he works sometime when the war time, seven days a week, because the president needed his assistance. How in the world can one man cover all this? There's probably hundreds of guys doing this now. 
This guy had to take care of every detailed step. When Mrs. Truman went into office, she said uh, to her husband, said, uh, this is a six foot four plow boy with these great big hands. He's going to be disruptive in a tea party. So he's going to have to go. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Fields decides to have her a tea party. So he fixes a piece of paper up with all the names on there and hands it to her. And Mrs. Uh, Truman looks at it and she goes, tea party, huh? And down on the listing there has all her friends, what time the plane's going to arrive, what time the limo's going to pick them up, how many lumps of sugar, what <laughs> kinds of tea they like, and what desserts they like. This is the job of a butler. Every time he hosted someone from another country, he had to know their favorite food, what time they liked it, the wine and dining, he had to know this. Yeah. So that was Felix's job. And that's why he was so good at what he did. That's where the movie should have been justified because here is the, really the kicker behind that movie. There's 30 books from the time of Hoover to Eisenhower every day is documented. Everything behind closed doors, everything that took place in the White House. We have five of the books that are here, and you look at the very top up here, it says November the 1st, 1951, when Queen Elizabeth was a young girl, she's coming to the White House, and he writes down in his own words. These books value here is, a num you know, the number of dollars you can't put it on there. But every time I would put my little white gloves on and could flip a page in here, I found some really valuable, valuable information. How many of you know that the most important decisions during World War I and World War II, where were those important decisions made at? Mr. Thomas Jefferson, in his time at the White House, planted in the backyard a chestnut tree. And every D-Day and all the decisions from World War I and II were made under that tree. It's wrote down in this book from Mr. Fields of what took place. And one of the uh, times when Roosevelt was in office there, one of the commanding officers said, uh, he can't be here, he's just a servant. I mean, he could tell our secrets and everything. So Mr. Roosevelt looks up and says, put some numbers behind Fields' name, he just become an agent. So now, <laughs> now he is a servant, but he is an agent. So all of this good stuff is in these books. I will hope and pray that one day that we will get the other 30 here at his hometown base and we'll get those uh, actually documented and dig digitized so that we can have those preserved. These things here really need to go and be put away for a later use down the road. But we'll see what happens in that time. The show that feels was an outstanding person and all the things he did in Philadelphia and, and Here's W.H. Bush Sr. Mr. Sr. Uh, Bush just passed away not too long ago. But here Fields is, 97 years of age. He's got a gala, Bush has got a gala event going on to the White House. And guess who gets invited? It was a special invitation, Alonzo Fields. So, very thought of. Uh, the repertory theater, looking over the president's shoulder, someday I'm going to finally get that thing down on our end that I'd like to bring this uh, one-man play to the uh, stage and uh, it is a hit. If you ever get a chance to go and see this uh, play, it is definitely worth the time to uh, take out to go see that because with Fields telling the story and that's how my good friend here, James Steele from Cal LA, California, uh, put this Together, between his 21 years in the White House, the red books you see over there, he was able to put an outstanding um, play together. March 7th, 1887, this is the stamp right here that Mr. W.H. Roundtree would have been using. <coughs> Somebody mentioned about Mr. Carlisle's in school at one time. Well, this is Mr. Carlisle's in his early years. 45 and wrote this book on Wild Station, and then with the joint adventure with James Madison at, at the IU Bloomington, they wrote Yesterday and Today. These two books are, uh, we don't have any down at the gift shop, but I'm saying they're out there floating around at the various uh, libraries and stuff. And 
there's one other book that has been written about Wild Station, and it was 13 years after the Civil War. I do have a copy of it. It was a family from Bloomington, I believe, that brought it down. So uh, these two twins right here, we knew Carl. One was the farmer. This is the farmer, and this is uh, Dr. Wiles. So uh, let's see. Go around the corner here and talk about some of these balls. <laughs> this is uh, Matthias Maltox. He was the principal at Dusty Sags, and they do have a uh, section in the high school up there that they still honor him. He was most, he took that high school to the top level, the most uh, outstanding school in the state of Indiana in the 1927 uh, time frame because this guy would not give up on the kids. He would catch a kid out there on the street walking that he should be in school and he would pick them up and take him to school. He would tell them the next morning if they don't show up in class, he's gonna to come to their house and pick them up so they will be in school. And basically he got a lot of his uh, uh, structure from Mr. Uh, Principal himself here, Mr. Lucas. This is uh, Hester Greer, she went to Indianapolis. <clears throat> Entered into ministry back in 1905 and Church of God. She was uh, building two new churches in Indianapolis and that wasn't big enough. And she decided, what else can I do in life? So she moves on to Afghanistan and builds this church. And then she goes to Cuba and builds this church and helps a body of people there. Spent the rest of her lifetime as a missionary in the other foreign countries. Another one of our kids grew up right here at Wild Station, but seeing the picture, there's greater things out there in the big world. Right behind you in the bottom case right here, Aaron Fisher is the most decorated soldier in the state of Indiana. That picture you see right there is behind the governor's office up here at uh, Indianapolis because he is noted as the hero of War I. He received the McGarrett Award. He also got the Purple Heart and was the most decorative soldier in Indiana at one time. He grew up here, 15 and a half years of age, entered into the military, spent an entire lifetime in the military. Um, he's buried over in Ohio, but uh, the outstanding story behind this young man, he was dedicated to serving his country. So, uh, any questions? Let's go down and talk about the Smithsonian. When you get there, you'll get there five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. We were lucky enough that a phone call came in on a Sunday afternoon after church. And I answered it and it was Paul Gardeau, one of the nine curators for the African American Museum. We talked about Wild Station, talked about the farming and the history behind it. So he came down in July. And from that, it's all about history from that point on eight years ago. Our location is in the middle of the third floor. There's five floors above the ground and there's three below. Yes, there is a slave ship at the very bottom of the basement here. It talks about and has, I can't remember the number of how many was on a certain size ship. But I was thinking it was like 480 slaves were, actually they only had just so much room, elbow to elbow, to lay on that ship for the time that they left from wherever they left in Africa to the time they got to America. And that's why there was 50% of the people didn't make it. But the <coughs> bottom uh, three floors put on good, comfortable shoes is one advice. And as you go through the African American history, you will actually end up at the top four talking about from the music to the instruments to you name it. And this is pretty well telling the whole African American history story in this side of this building. I think it's 500 million square feet. It's huge. Here's a big old railroad car, passenger car, and you can see how huge this building really is. So <clears throat> you got to have a vision, right? I'm going to go shut this door. I'm not going to get you, okay? I just want to show you something. We did this in 07. This is where we would like to be in the next 10 years. It's 25 acres. And we want to build a campsite here for our kids, but expand this to the level 
that these children that come here will be able to take something away from here by being here three days, five days, whatever the length of time. We want to put an amphitheater here in the background. We're going to recreate old downtown line station. This building here will be for art craft, for our type of wood crafts that we'll build. There will be 12 more log cabins throughout the grounds. Kids come and they stay overnight through the log cabins. will be daytime for leaderships and talk about good citizenship and bulliness and all that. Over in this area here will be the principal's house. You go through a certain room and you will have a history of our plow station as you break the laser beam. Right over here will be a big peg barn. That peg barn will talk about agriculture from the time that from beef and uh, grain and all the different dairy, all the different parts of our farming and our ag will be in this building so that our children will have a better understanding about good healthy food and where their food comes from. Down here will be a farmer's market. This will be a restaurant. We all will have lemonade if we have that in place. That will be able to set 450 kids down at one time. Our camp will be based off of string instruments, brass instruments, archery. That's the type of camp we want to build here. That's our vision for the next 10 years. We're working with grant writers right now, and our hope and goal is we can keep making changes. Right in this area right now, we just put in a brand new $40,000 shelter house. That's one of the steps that we made this year. And we put in a whole new electric system to uh, maintain uh, growth for the future, for the back of the school back here in this area here. We would like to see uh, this expand so that we will be able to start moving toward bringing more children here than that 15, 20,000 that we're talking about. We should be able to take this uh, 25 acres and be able to expand on education that we can bring Chicago, Indianapolis, all the inner city kids so they can learn and be educated on their past as well as what the future stands for. And then maybe we can take some of this hardship of <coughs> misunderstanding out of the middle of the picture and let people open their eyes and know the real true history that is the truth that was behind it. We all started out as farmers in the very beginning. And we have to have that history pulled back together that we all survive by working together. There, could, there was a farmer up the road here less than a mile. He was a white farmer that was part of the Underground Railroad. His last name was Starmond. If he had a lame horse up there, he could come down here to John or Joe's house and get a horse and plow on his field that day because they work together. Mm -hmm. And those are the pieces of this whole camp that we're putting together to be able to undo what our country has, I don't know, pulled a string and got us all running in too many directions. But how are we gonna knit this back together as connection of being survival, of being one, and not so many as being everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can do with this campsite. So that's our future plans. This is plan A. We got a plan B that's already in the works. We're just kind of working it out. With the night at the museum, the kids come, they have an eight by 11 map and they follow this map. They'll go through 12 different characters. That's a summer months event that we play and roll, roll out. They will go to, let's say, into the classroom there. Mr. Joe Lucas will be froze up. They drop a key in. He comes alive for three minutes and talks about his part in history. They go out to the backside and they'll have Mr. Thomas Cole out there in the log cabin. He uh, comes alive for three minutes and talk about his part, how he played a part in the Underground Railroad, moving slaves through Lyle Station. One of the Civil War tents would be out here, and that person will talk about the time when we were in the middle of the Civil War. We have this all scripts were put together by some of the Vincennes uh, University uh, students and teachers, and we uh, host that through the summer months. We just, and I didn't tell you about the trunk in there, but we have a big, huge trunk that talks all about the Underground Railroad. It has a teacher's uh, 30 books in there to teach a class for a full week. There is the, gu the guides in there 
everything that the teacher needs. Everything including maps, shackles, cotton, Confederate money, Union money, you name it, it's in this trunk for her to go into her classroom at the fourth grade level and educate them on our history of our country and how things took place. There's easy reading material in there, booklets, you know, and um, we just felt like that was very important eight years ago to put that together and we have been able to send that out to all the schools with no charge. So it's really well, uh, Stringtown right now is, is one of the schools that has a trunk. Illinois uh, will be uh, Wabash County over here. They have the, the other truck. We only have two, but they go out all the time. One, uh, last summer, year-round school at Indianapolis, drove three miles, three hours down here, picked up the trunk, and then brought it back in three hours. So, Wild Station wants to expand in education, and how can we meet the uh, goals of change for tomorrow? We have to keep making better programs. This is the end of my tour. Hope you uh, come back and see me uh, another time. We, uh, we want to keep moving forward to make a difference. And one of the things that makes a difference is when I went to Washington, D.C. and talked to the people of the Ag Department that helped us with the biggest part of the money to make this what we are standing in. We're standing in a million dollar building. Now we get this thing done. But we have taken that million dollar building and we have turned it into education. And it has been a plus for all the tri-state area because of uh, the kids that we've been able to educate them and give them an understanding of how this country was built. And it started out with us cutting the first tree down. Jim, thank you so much for all you do. Keep up the good work. Yeah. Sam's gonna try up on this end to do his part.